Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Alice Bryant and Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Alice Bryant. Last week, United States officials announced a decision that affects most international students and all dreamers. The term dreamer means immigrants who were brought to the United States illegally as children. They are permitted to stay under the government's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, or DACA. President Donald Trump's administration decided to bar these students from getting emergency aid. The aid is part of a nearly $2 trillion government program. The U.S. Congress approved the money to help people and businesses hurt by the coronavirus crisis. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos put the restriction in new federal guidelines released last week. These rules tell colleges and universities how to give out more than $6 billion in aid grants. The money is supposed to help students pay for costs resulting from the coronavirus pandemic. Earlier guidance from the Department of Education suggested schools would have fewer restrictions on how to give out the monies. But the new guidelines said that only students who can receive other federal student aid can get this assistance. University officials and immigrant groups denounced the decision. They said DeVos is setting limits that were not included in the congressional legislation. The aid package did not identify which students can get the grants. And many colleges had planned to give the grants to needy students, whether or not they are U.S. citizens. Because of the change, some highly respected universities are rejecting the federal money. Princeton University announced that it would refuse its 2.4 million-dollar share of the coronavirus aid package. Harvard University is rejecting its $8.7 million in aid. The Education Department said its guidance is worded like other federal laws. It noted the Higher Education Act, a law that says only U.S. citizens and a small group of non-citizens can get federal student aid. Angela Morabito, a department representative, said the rescue legislation makes clear that this relief money should be targeted to U.S. citizens. But some higher education activists disagree with that claim. The American Council on Education is an organization of college presidents. It says the rescue package placed no limits on student eligibility. The guidelines have created misunderstandings about exactly which students can receive the grants, says Terry Hartle, one of the council's leaders. It is clear the Education Department is leaving out immigrants who were brought to the U.S. illegally and international students, he added. But it is unclear how schools should define eligibility. 
Most colleges do not ask students if they are U.S. citizens, he said, and officials have no easy way to find out. A college could give an emergency grant to a dreamer without realizing the person is a dreamer, Hartle said. At the University of California, Riverside, officials had been planning to give grants to some of the school's estimated 600 dreamers. Now, those officials are looking for other ways to help students blocked by the Education Department guidelines. Student activists see DeVos's action as a major change from her earlier guidance. When DeVos made the aid available in early April, she said colleges would be given the chance to decide how to award the grants. She told college officials to help the neediest students. And in documents that colleges sign to receive the grants, the Education Department says the money is not considered federal financial aid. That earlier guidance led some schools to believe the grants were not subject to citizenship requirements. Sarah Goldrick Rabb is a professor of higher education policy and sociology at Temple University in Pennsylvania. She says the new restrictions are hard on students who were expecting the grants to pay for food, housing, and other costs. It is also unfair to colleges that now must move quickly to amend plans for giving out the aid. Losing access to the grants will likely force some students to leave school, Goldrick Rabb said. She noted this is especially true for students whose families are dealing with unemployment from the pandemic. Critics say the policy is especially unjust because the students now blocked from receiving grants were counted in the math used to decide on money for schools. The rescue package provided $14 billion for the nation's colleges and universities. Each was offered an amount based on its student population and the percentage of students from poorer backgrounds. The United We Dream Network, which campaigns for dreamers, said it was callous of DeVos to block so many students from getting the aid. Sanaa Abrar, the group's advocacy director, urged Congress and colleges to find other ways to help students affected by DeVos's directive. Scientists say they have used artificial intelligence, AI, to create music to represent the protein structure of the new coronavirus. Researchers used machine learning methods to make the music, which they say may help them better understand the virus. The research team assigned musical notes to amino acids that make up the so-called spiked protein that infects human cells. Machine learning was then used to turn the protein and structural information into a nearly two-hour piece of classical music. Marcus Bühler of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, led the research team. He recently reported the results in a study appearing in the publication APL Bioengineering. Bühler told the Reuters news agency that turning the protein data into music lets people gain a better understanding of something they cannot see. 
you would need many different images, many different magnifications to see with your eyes, what your ears can pick up with just a couple of seconds of music, he said. Bueller added that although the proteins themselves speak a language we don't understand, music can be a way to improve that understanding. If we are going to be able to solve that language, we could solve many problems, not only for this disease, but for many other diseases. The finished selection was uploaded to the music sharing website SoundCloud for the public to hear. Listeners of the early part of the piece described it with words such as beautiful, interesting, calm, and nature. Bueller said this part of the music represents the ease at which the spiked protein enters the human cell, making the coronavirus highly contagious. He noted that the virus is very good at tricking the cell to open the doors to infect someone. As the virus then reproduces and the spiked protein attaches to more cells, the music becomes louder, faster, and more intense. One SoundCloud user noted that this part could represent one of the first signs of the virus in humans, a high body temperature. Others described the more intense part of the music as scary and sad. The researchers say a possible next step could be to use the musical method to design an antibody to attack the virus. Bueller said the fast spread of the new coronavirus had made it important to open our brains to other ways of processing information. He noted that the usual antibody design methods require a large number of proteins and a long testing process. In the current crisis, we don't have the luxury of time, Bueller said. The study states that musical representations of proteins could also be used as a tool to help design new protein materials for many uses in biology, medicine, and engineering. I'm Brian Lynn. Are you at risk of getting seriously ill from the new coronavirus? Here are some things to keep in mind. 80% of coronavirus cases are mild. Young and healthy people are at low risk. Other people and those with serious health conditions have a greater risk of serious illness or even death. If you have a cough, fever, and difficulty breathing, contact a doctor and stay away from other people. For more information, visit the World Health Organization website at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. For most of the 1990s, the nation was at peace. 
The Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, bringing an end to years of costly military competition. During the 90s, the American economy recovered from a recession and grew strong. Inflation and unemployment were low. There were new developments in medicine and technology. The Internet began to evolve from a defense project mainly linking researchers into a new way for the world to communicate. America grew by almost 33 million people during the 1990s, the largest increase of any decade in its history. By the end of the 90s, more than 280 million people were living in the United States. During the decade of the 90s, there was a large increase in immigration from Latin America, the Caribbean, and Asia. For the first time in 70 years, one in 10 Americans was born in another country. At the same time, the population was getting older. That added to the nation's health care costs. America's new president, Bill Clinton, promised to reform the health care system. But in the end, like other presidents before him, Clinton failed to win support for that idea in Congress. Divorce rates in the United States had begun to grow sharply in the 1970s. By the 90s, those rates were starting to drop. But there were millions of children living with only one parent or with their grandparents. Single-parent families are more likely to be poor. In 1980, single-parent households represented about 20% of all households in the United States with children. By 1990, that number had reached 24% and was continuing to rise. In 1991, a black man named Rodney King led police in Los Angeles on a high-speed chase. After the chase, officers tried to arrest him. A man living nearby videotaped police officers striking King repeatedly with their sticks and kicking him on the ground. The officers later said King had resisted even after they shocked him with an electric stun gun. The man took the 81-second video to a local television station. Soon, people all over the country were watching it. The beating led to criminal charges against four white police officers. The trial was moved out of Los Angeles. Their lawyers argued that the officers might not receive a fair trial there. On April 29, 1992, a mostly white jury in a community north of the city returned its findings. The jury found the officers not guilty of assaulting Rodney King. Anger at the jury's verdict soon led to rioting that began in the largely poor black neighborhoods of South Central Los Angeles. Don't go near this area, South Central Los Angeles at Florence and Normandy, because there is still no police presence there, and a lot of people trying to get through that intersection have been assaulted with rocks and bottles and sticks. More than 50 people died in days of violence before police and troops brought the unrest under control. Many more were injured, and hundreds of buildings were destroyed by fire. It was some of the worst rioting in American history and received worldwide attention. The following year, a federal jury found two of the officers who had beaten Rodney King guilty of violating his civil rights they were sent to prison. Another case in Los Angeles that received international attention also involved a racial element. O.J. Simpson, a black former football star and motion picture actor, 
was charged with murdering his white former wife and a male friend of hers. They were stabbed to death in 1994. Many legal experts believe the case against Simpson was strong. So did many more whites than blacks in public opinion surveys. A mostly black jury found Simpson not guilty. But later, in a civil case brought by the victim's families, a mostly white jury found him responsible for the killings and ordered him to pay damages. In 1990, researchers launched the Human Genome Project. This was a government-supported effort to identify and map all of the genes in the body. The Human Genome Project raised hopes for new medical treatments and cures for diseases. The project lasted 13 years until 2003. In 2000, President Clinton announced the completion of a working draft of the genome. It will revolutionize the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of most, if not all, human diseases. During the 1990s, personal computers became more and more a part of everyday life. And more and more people were going online over a network linking computers around the world. The internet would grow into an easy way to send email, find information, and buy products over the World Wide Web. In music, many Americans in the early 90s were listening to a new sound from the Pacific Northwest. It became known as grunge rock. The capital for grunge bands was Seattle in Washington State. One of the best known bands was Nirvana. Their 1991 album, Nevermind, contains some of their most successful songs, including Smells Like Teen Spirit. Kurt Cobain's old, the husband of singer Courtney Love, and one of the most influential musicians of his day. On television, millions of people watched shows like ER, a drama series about a busy hospital emergency room. Many fans tuned in to watch George Clooney play a young doctor on the show. What's going on? Mr. Abbott asked us to try to resuscitate his son. Still flatline, atrophine tube epi. He shouldn't have made it through the night. Who the hell are you? I'm Dr. Ross. <laughs> Look, he was in my care. <laughs> ER first went on the air in 1994 and lasted 15 years. Law and Order was a crime drama, but it took a different path involving the interactions of police, lawyers, and judges. The popularity of the series, set in New York, led to several related Law and Order spin-off series. For laughs, millions of people watched shows like Seinfeld and Friends. Friends were Ross, Rachel, Monica, Phoebe, Joey, and Chandler six young New Yorkers. Seinfeld was also set in, you guessed it, New York. It starred comedian Jerry Seinfeld playing himself. The series was hugely popular and won many awards. TV Guide magazine put it at the top of its 2002 list of the 50 greatest shows of all time. Well, I... Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me one second. Hello? Oh, gee, I, I can't talk right now. Why don't you give me your home number and I'll call you later? Uh, well, I'm sorry. We're not allowed to do that. Oh, I guess you don't want people calling you at home. No. Well, now you know how I feel. <laughs> Seinfeld was, in the words of its creator, a show about nothing. But Jerry and his friends, Elaine, George, and Kramer, managed to find plenty of humor in life's everyday problems and situations. Another popular show in the 90s was the animated series, The Simpsons, which, like Seinfeld, 
premiered in 1989. New episodes of The Simpsons, Homer, Marge, Bart, Lisa, and Maggie, continued into the 21st century. Titanic was called the ship of dreams. And it was. It really was. All right, open your eyes. The 1997 film Titanic became the first movie to reach $1 billion in ticket sales at theaters worldwide. You never know what hand you're gonna get dealt next. You learn to take life as it comes at you. When the ship docks, I'm getting off with you. Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet played young lovers on the famous ship that sank in April 1912 after hitting an iceberg in the North Atlantic. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Another popular film was Jurassic Park, released in 1993. In it, dinosaurs from prehistoric times are brought back to life with disastrous results. We're gonna make a fortune with this place. In sports, baseball players went on strike in 1994. The World Series championship was canceled that year. In basketball, millions of fans were watching Michael Jordan lead the Chicago Bulls to championships. As the 90s came to a close, people around the world were preparing to celebrate the arrival of the year 2000. It was a big event, but there were also concerns about the millennium bug, or Y2K issue. This was the worry that older computers might not be able to recognize the calendar change. Lots of activity went into making sure things would go smoothly after midnight on December 31st, 1999. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.